That Great Business Show, Ireland's Best Business Podcast. Welcome to episode 159 of That Great Business Show, where we bring you more great tips, insights, and unique business opportunities on every episode, all delivered in that commute friendly package. And it's all thanks to our sponsor, daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. If you're looking for your first home, or maybe you're looking to upsize or downsize, make sure you visit daft.ie to find the next place you call home. I am Conal O'Moran. We got a lovely bit of feedback from Julie Garland, founder and CEO of Avtrain, her drone training and consultancy company. Julie joined us way back on episode 95, so that's over a year ago, when she told us that we'll have air taxis delivering the world's top golfers around Adair Manor when the Ryder Cup hits here in 2027. Julie, who's also a pilot, was on board an Aer Lingus long haul flight recently and told her followers on LinkedIn that she was receiving that great business show loud and clear at 30,000 feet, as we are now part of Aer Lingus's in-flight entertainment. Don't forget to sign up for the podcast so that you're in with a chance of winning two fab direct flights to Hartford, Connecticut, thanks to Aer Lingus. Yes, it's that simple. And you get the added benefit of getting your own personal copy of the podcast every week. How posh is that? All our tips and insights are brought to you, as I say, thanks to daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. If it's for sale, it's on daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. Whether you're looking for your first home or planning your next move, make sure you're on daft.ie, the best place to buy or sell in Ireland. Travel to Connecticut, USA with Aer Lingus service to Bradley International Airport. With the daily flights from Dublin to Hartford, we make business travel to Connecticut easy. Save time with US preclearance, enjoy Aer Lingus award-winning flight service and experience the convenience of Bradley International Airport, perfectly situated for your travel needs. Learn more and plan your next business trip at aerlingus.com. On episode 126, we were joined by Sharon Farrell of credit consultancy FACE, F-A-C-E, when she explained one of the basics of business, and that is how to get paid. An absolute essential, Sharon said, was to do a credit check on your potential customers, no matter how small you or they are. So how do you do that? Well, by using a credit checking agency. Criff Vision Net is one of those companies that helps customers manage commercial risk and consumer screening requirements. That's a nice way of saying they spot dodgy. And head dodgy spotter is Christine Cullen, MD and co-founder of Criff Vision Net, or Vision Net as she prefers to call it. Hi, Christine. Hi, how are you? What an intro. Thank you very much. <laughs> are you? Are spot you, dodgy. You, I'll have to hold you, that one up. <laughs> can you spot dodge at 100 metres or 1,000 metres? Oh, 1, I don't meters? know about that. I'm not sure, you know. Um, well, you know, in the corporate sense, maybe we can we can give people a few tips. You sure. have just told me that you've been at this for a while. We won't yeah. say how many years. Thank you very a much. A while. For, very gracious of you. Yeah, a few decades. We put it at that. <laughs> and how did it all start? Well, so VisionNet started back, I think, 1993. Yeah, there, thereabouts, would you believe? And uh, we started to profile companies in Ireland and we, we took the accounts from the company's registration office. And at that time, it was all to do with European legislation, private Irish companies who were availing of the veil of protection that we all have of being limited companies had to make public their accounts. So and it was, was that, going to be the end of the world, wasn't it? Oh, my goodness. And our compliance was atrocious to begin with. We were like, oh, look. But yeah, no, not, not today. Thank you very much. So we started out and I think we'd, we'd about 30% compliance. And when I say compliance, I mean only about 30% of companies actually filed anything with the company's registration office. And at the time, if we look maybe at the UK, they had about 90% compliance. So they were the good kids. We were the bad kids in Europe at the time. It, so it took a while for companies to get on board. But pretty soon, um, that sort of wealth of information that you can get on Irish businesses, people start to use it and rely on it to make better business decisions. You know, it really can be instrumental in determining the longevity and success of a business if you know who you're dealing with and do those credit checks. So that's how we started. The digital age came. 
we started selling modems because no one knew what the internet was. We had, you know, before that we were selling information on CD and we were quickly um, set up a business called SoloCheck, which was one of the first and still exists information business sites in Ireland where people could access information online. So we'd, we'd very little uh, knowledge of the internet or how to go about it. So we partnered and that's how we started and, and the vision that came from SoloCheck. And I have a pal and he's a very prominent mm. and well-known businessman. And when I'm on the chatting to the phone with him, you might be discussing Jim, Jack or Mary or Monica. He's always got his credit check website open and he'll talk to me about them. And I think it's fascinating. But he is the other end of mm. the spectrum, I suppose, mm -hmm. because not enough people, according to Sharon Farrell, mm. do do that basic credit check. It doesn't take long no. and it's not expensive. It's not expensive at all. And I'm a fact checker. I'm that person who opens up Google. Let me just check that for you. Because I just have this desire to get things right as much as possible. And I think some of us are like that. But this is it. I mean, it's very, very inexpensive. It can help a business thrive, really help a business thrive to know who you're dealing with. So and it's only a couple of euro and you don't even have to sign up. And we have two websites. One is SolarCheck and the other is VisionNet. VisionNet is for more corporate. SolarCheck is for everybody and it's really accessible for micro enterprise. Or even if you're getting a kitchen fitted and you've, you, know, you put that deposit down, just check the company out. It's three or four euro. And you can make a decision, even if you don't know how to read a set of accounts. We want to change something and make it really accessible and, and something you understand. Perfect segue. I'm loving it <laughs> because what do you look for? So you've paid your three, four, five quid and you want to see whether Acme Windows or I hope there isn't an Acme Windows out there. You yeah, know what I mean? There is a low, so many Acmes, you wouldn't believe <laughs> okay, it. Okay, <laughs> well, a window company. Yeah. Uh, and you were trying to find out if they're going to stay in business. What are yeah. the big, big red warning signs? Well, if you're looking at things like SolarCheck, what I would suggest to do, first of all, is to see is the company a limited entity. And even if they're not limited, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, but it just know who you're dealing with. Are you dealing with a limited entity or is it a business name? A business name being, it could be a sole trader or a partnership. So establish that first. The next thing I'd have a look at and see when the company was incorporated. And maybe depending on the size of the company, who you're dealing with. Are you dealing with a director, shareholder? And in Ireland, because 80% of our companies are sort of small to medium enterprises, quite often you've got owner managed business. So you, the, the director is the shareholder, is the managing director, is the accountant, is the hiring person. Quite often you'll find that's the case. Again, just to know who you're dealing with. Depending on the decision and, and how important this is to you, be it, you know, something on the domestic front or something on the corporate front, you can have a look at the, the company and how it's faring financially. And you can also have a look at the people behind the company. So I would look at a company and we have a traffic light system, for example. And the traffic light system is, you know, green, orange and red. And when you get to a stage of red, it means stop, you know, take a moment to pause and decide where you're going from there. Sorry, when you say you've got your traffic lights, is this up on the website? So it there, is, absolutely. So yeah. I see a red and it's saying, hey, hang on a second now. Do you know what it is? We, we score companies out of 100. That's how we do this. But how the model works is we took thousands and thousands of companies uh, who were successful and we took thousands and thousands of companies who had what we called an out of business failure, a, 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 an unfavorable out of business failure. And we looked at data points within those companies who had an unfavorable out of business. And we looked for patterns and things that happened to those companies. And that's really what the score model is. And there's three different types of score model. You've got a statistical score model, you've got a blended score model and a judgmental score model. And what we do is a blended score model. So basically, yes. I prefer the judgmental system. one. I'll change your man's an off man altogether. I'll tell well, you who. There's a bit of that. There's absolutely a bit of that. And a lot of credit professionals like a judgmental. We weight the different characteristics because materiality comes into, you know, especially with Irish businesses. And what you find a lot of companies who are rating businesses across Europe, they'll take a score algorithm based on European companies and they'll apply it to Ireland and go, that job done. Well, no, it's, you know, because actually our Irish companies are quite unique. We say different things in our accounts, the auditor's qualification, although, you know, it is standardised, but there's different ways of saying things. So we, we don't take a European scorecard and it's model a it. a different way of saying things. Are you spotting funny usage of words and stuff, you know, could do better type of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of things we have learned and watched out for over the years. And we have this thing we call worrying phrases. And there's lots of different ways that, you know, auditors and accountants might present something which they're responsible to do that might be a little bit more palatable, for example, for the directors and shareholders of a company, because we all have to be compliant. So we have qualifications and we have 
worrying phrases. Now, we're not going to say they're worrying phrases, but I, you know, just rest assured that you're in good hands, that the, the score model looks at everything. I don't know what size your team is, but are there fellows, women sitting there looking for worrying phrases? There are machines that look for worrying ah, okay. phrases. And behind the machines, there are indeed people. There are data scientists and there are credit experts. How many so people have to, you got actually working with you? Well, actually, so, so in Ireland, we have Envision that we have 20 people working with us, but we're part of a large international company with six and a half thousand business professionals. And that's where the CRIF name that's comes from. That's where the CRIF from. comes in. Okay. Yeah, it's an Italian fintech. Back to things to watch out for, because anybody who's in business is sitting there saying, come on, come on, tell me what I should look out for. Okay, so what I would look out for, first of all, I would check and, and look at the, this. You don't, you don't even know how, need to know how to read a balance sheet. That's really important to us. We wanted to get something that everybody could use. So that's why we decided to go with a statistical kind of just, look, let's make it simple. Let's go traffic light. So high trade risk is our red. We score out of 100. So that's from zero to 59. And what we're saying there is, look, open credit is not something we'd really gar- we'd really recommend at this time. And we'd say it, it's really anyone that is an elevated to very high credit risk. So for there, we would say, you know, maybe think again before making a decision, paying a deposit or extending credit. Fair trade risk would be someone who'd score between 60 and 79. And there we'd recommend a degree of prudence. And then low trade risk is 80 to 100. Um, and that's kind of the premium kind of score. And go back to the eight, to the red light one. Yeah. That's really a void. I mean, don't go near them. Well, you know what? The thing about it is it's a void at the moment. Or, or be careful. Seek guarantees. So maybe maybe if you're extending credit in the corporate world, you might decide to go get, you know, a cash on, on delivery of your goods or services. You might decide to get cash either up front or payment up front or on delivery because a lot of companies can trade out a difficulty. And, you know, we're very pro-business and we want to be, I mean, a, a companies can go through, it's a roller coaster. Running a business is a roller coaster and we want to be very, very careful. We have to be unbiased and we have to make sure that we protect the veracity and integrity of our scorecard. But just because a company has had a negative or, or is red at the moment, it doesn't mean they won't trade out a difficulty. And that's another thing that we do. We provide the history of the scorecard because it's important to see the passion of how this business has traded. So sometimes it might be, it might be good, it might be bad, it might be good, it might be bad. And it's, you know, it's important to see, well, where are we on that cycle? So we will give all of our customers a history of when the score changed, a little note on to why it changed. So we might say, look, later set of accounts have been filed, a judgment has come up or something like that. And you can just, you know, look at the pattern. And the other thing we do is we look at the accounts over as many years as we can get. So we'll look at it over as many years as we have and we, we have all the years. But we will, we will show you five years of sets of accounts on that credit report. Uh, you don't have to get into it, but you can have a look at it and see, is it up, is it down? H- how much are we talking about? Small, small differences won't change or negatively impact the score. A judgment for not paying a debt or a revenue default, that, that will have a negative impact on a score or even being late to file your accounts because that speaks a little bit to governance and there is a statistical correlation between companies that are late in filing and what we call unfavourable out of business, I'm afraid. <laughs> so You're very careful with your choice of words there. You know, I just feel for Irish businesses, it's hard to run a business. Oh, and, you betcha. I you know. know yeah. And we want to be fair, but we have to be unbiased, you know. When you go out at night to a dinner party, to a pub or whatever, tell the truth now. Okay. <laughs> Do you know the credit worthiness of the, your pals and all? Are you looking at them and they're making claims about such and such and you say, that guy? He doesn't even tell the truth in his accounts. (laughs) Frankly, in the beginning, I think we did a lot of uh, looking around. I mean, I'm talking about when this information started to become available and your natural curiosity was something, I mean, you know, a couple of, you know, 20 years ago plus. Now, not so much. No, not at all. You know, um, obviously, we watch Irish business and we're interested. And when you look at things that you see in the newspaper, you think, "Mm, really, really? But I I wish I had time. (laughs) But yeah, that's a rabbit hole. You can just get caught down. So no, I don't know. Sadly. Some might believe you. <laughs> so what else should the smaller business owner or user of services keep looking out for? They've got your red light or your mm. green light. What else? The big telltale points that people should keep looking at. And this can be done on a click of a button as well. So it's an instant. Yeah, it's absolutely instant. And it only takes a moment to check. You just type in a company name into the website. We have two websites. One is a membership website. The cost of the reports are going to be a little bit lower on that website. You buy a number of credits and you use them over a course of a year. The lovely thing about that particular website, VisionNet, is that it monitors the company. So once you do a search, our default option is to monitor unless you tell us not to. So if I did a search on our friend Acme, if anything happened on that company, we'll email you for the period of time that you're a member. So say you join up for a year. How much is membership for a year for a small 
small anything company. From, anything from 200 euro. And there's no membership fee. That that 200 euro is actually used. You can use it against credits to download reports. So membership is free. When you just you just have to buy credit. And the a typical report costs how much? A typical report would be about two euro. Yeah, so, so you're really, really small. Lot, yeah. You really, really can. And we monitor for free. So we will say to you, look, you did a, you did a check on Acme um, or you did a check on VisionNet, let's say, and something has changed. And we'll give you the option of whether or not you want to view that change. You don't pay for that service because you may or may not have decided to do trade with this particular company. So it's up to you whether you want to pull down the new information or not. And we'll also look at things that have happened in the media as well, to a certain extent. They're not so much business stories, but more things like if uh, if something has happened, which we think might negatively impact the, the company, there might be a meeting of creditors, there might be uh, a receiver might be appointed, something that, you know, we, we have this thing called risk watch, which also has another layer of monitoring. Uh, or if there's been a status change, like an awful lot of companies, their status is going from normal, which is normal, to strike off for filing their accounts late. I mean, at the moment, I think there's about 30,000 companies that are already late in filing their accounts. That's another problem. And what usually happens with people being late to file the accounts is you have a situation where the auditors, if they're, they're large enough to have an auditor or an accountant, and the directors aren't agreeing on something. Or something isn't quite right that the auditor can't finish out their piece of work. And, and that's why we say there's a really, really important to engage with your auditor or accountant soon to answer any questions that they have, you know. That's because businesses are busy. So busy. They haven't got time. Yeah, it's now, so I know true. we have to, but I'm the world's worst. I know. It's hard. Well, not that I know that you. It, it's hard. It's, but it's oh, one of those do. things. Oh, you do. I bet you you did. I <laughs> bet you <laughs> you did. <laughs> I haven't, but I probably will now you said that. <laughs> no. I promise I'm all, all, no, no, I'm no. all above board. I promise, I promise, I promise. So back to the other one that you have, because you've got, I get I get an email in every week. I think it's business from your company, barometer. isn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah, the business barometer, I think it I is. I love yeah. that one. Oh, thank you very much. The business barometer is really, really high readership and click-through rates. And it's completely um, free. You don't have to be a member of That's either why service. I have user. No, <laughs> I'm delighted. Um, and what we, we decided to do is do a snapshot and try and take the real Irish economy. So what we're doing is we're sending out this email. We'll give you a little bit of information about trends in Irish business every single week. It comes out every Friday. Friday morning. So, you know, we, we looked at all the different days that would be a good day to release this. And we noticed that, look, more people are engaging and, and are interested in this on a Friday morning, you know, because okay, the bulk of work is done. I'm not yet busy. So that's when we send it out. And we'll tell you, you know, what liquidators might have been appointed, how many judgments have come up. And you can go in and click through and get, you know, useful information. And there's usually tips and tricks and some information on what's happening. And, and really every quarter we'll provide um, a review of the last quarter. So for example, might go on startups, insolvencies, closures. I think that it's a really great way to see the real economy because we see so many figures in the newspaper and it's so difficult in the media just to try and get a cap. What's actually happening on the ground? Well, we'll tell you what's actually happening. Well, you tell me now, what is happening now in the Irish economy? Well, I think we're going through um, a period of, you know, change in the Irish economy. You know, we're seeing a lot, a lot of companies incorporating. We expect that How to be many, about... How many, you think? Yeah, I expect this year to be about 23,000 companies incorporated this year. And is that an awful lot or a lot? Or? 2021, I think, was our biggest year, which was over nearly 26,000 companies. What's interesting at the moment is more people are forming companies now than they are than setting up business names and, and sole traders. So business name and sole trader is a, a, it's a less expensive, less legally structured way to set up and start a business. You don't get the, you know, name protection that you might get with a limited company, but you also don't have all the require, you know, the obligations that you might have with a limited company. And in Ireland, it's actually really easy to set up a company and it's not as expensive as it might be in other countries. What we used to see is two business names for every one company set up. See, so it was a two to one ratio. And what we're seeing now is more people are setting up limited companies. So I think what we're seeing is we're still that nation of entrepreneurs. So a lot of people setting up in lots of different industries. But is Paddy getting more compliant? Obviously not if he's not filing his accounts. So, uh, <laughs> we're pretty good on the compliance, to be honest with you. Much, much better than we were when we started out. So people are filing. They're very compliant. Um, generally speaking, you know, we, we do about 80% of the companies, 85% of the companies are filing on time, which is great. On the uh, the business barometer, the one that you sent through, uh, I do see the, the appointment of liquidators, receivers mm. and all and all. When you see the above, 
I mean, a liquid air, well, that's it, isn't mm. it? What are the, the other red flag ones of those that I should be so keeping li- an eye on? Yeah, so a liquidator being appointed is a big one, but there's a lot of companies that just close the doors. I mean, a liquid going through a liquidation process is expensive and we know there's different mechanisms now for closing down a business. But, you know, a lot of companies just close the doors. I mean, I think there's 10,000 companies dissolved so far this year. They is, just, it, is that a lot? It is. I mean, what we find is that companies don't run into difficulty because they run out of ideas and they don't even run into difficulties that might surprise you because they run out of customers. They don't run out of determination or business. They run out of money. Mm. They run. And it's sad to see that. And it's, but it's, it's, it's what we see more and more. When we look at companies, the first couple of years, you might think like year one to three is a, um, a period of time where a company may be, you know, a little vulnerable. It's not actually the case. One to three, they're usually quite well funded. They're quite enthusiastic. They've got good ideas. You know, you know, they're working away and everything is fine. Years three to five or year three to seven, they're the dangerous years because sometimes the funding is running out. Uh, they're running out of steam. They're running into trouble. They're building up some bad debts. Um, they're not getting paid on time. So it's really, really important. I mean, late and non-payment of bills really, really can disrupt cash flow. And cash flow really kills businesses. And if you have to rely on interest bearing forms of capital, you know, you can see that in the balance sheet. And so, you know, I really would encourage people to have a look at people who you're doing business with, you know, and, and be really, really careful to tailor your credit terms. It's very, very important because it's a shame to see great businesses run out of money. And it is all on the click of a button. That's the most important thing. There's no work in this. No. You can be sitting watching TV and just glancing through and see oh, there's our pals Acme again. Yeah, yeah, uh, you really can. What are they up to this time? Exactly. And and there's no obligation. I mean, on the on the other side, SolarCheck, you can do a credit search for maybe five euro. Uh, you can get a basic company report for three euro. So you don't even have to sign up for that, that minimum deal. I mean, obviously we've got, you know, companies from every different size, but a small check can be really, really, really worthwhile. And again, I'm going to ask you to tell the truth. Okay. Do you guys do credit checks on companies that you do use or that you, you, we do. you deal, oh, deal with? Absolutely, we do. We do. We do credit checks on company we, we use. And, and more recently, we've had to look at the ESG and the sort of the, that sort of side of it as well, because that's becoming more and more important. And when I think about the importance of doing credit checks, that's one very big thing. But another thing, you know, is that sort of sustainability. And that's becoming more and more important for our business because, you know, we're here in Ireland, but we're part of a global company, a global enterprise. And sustainability is the very, very core of our value system. So we're starting to kind of really look and assess companies from a sustainability point of view. Except that hard core, hard nose, ESG and sustainability Mm. doesn't pay the bill. It's the other stuff. It's the fellas who won't pay the bills are your problem. Yeah, you know, it say it doesn't pay the bills and, it, and, and, you know, that's one school of thought. The other, and, you know, it's a, just another regulatory requirement that we have to deal with. Have we not enough within our KYC, our KYB? We've got to engage with our accountants. We've got to meet our payments with our stakeholders. We've got to speak to the banks and all that. But the thing about sustainability is that it is going to become really, really important. It's important now. We know this, okay? But it's going to be very, very important for every company in the next five years. And it's going to be important to the people who you do business with. So it mightn't seem like a pressing issue now, but I would encourage companies to start on that journey. And it could be something really, really small because what we're looking to do is look at any improvement. We've changed our light bulbs. We're we're doing away with plastic in the office. We've gone to a different energy provider or we're disposing of our waste in a certain way. Maybe we're moving to hybrid cars. Maybe we, we take the train. Maybe we have a remote working policy so our, our team don't have to come in and out using transport every single day. It can be tiny, tiny things. Diversity in the workplace, be it, you know, gender, be it anything, you know, age, everything. It's really, really important. And, and these companies do perform better. And there's so much research. It will become important because as we go on, all of the uh, legislation is coming down the tracks for scope three and supplier chain. So even our smallest companies in Ireland will have to present some sort of a, a statement on, on the sustainability. So starting now and just thinking about like, how, how can I make a more sustainable business? It is going to become something that's going to be very important and in tandem with the credit ratings, I think, in the next five years. Two final questions. Sure. I normally only ask one, but okay. there's a second one. You have been dealing with companies for a long time. Mm. What small, one small change would you cry if you saw departments of either finance or industry or ministers for this, that and the other? Just one small little change that would make business life in Ireland just a little bit better. Well, that's a good question. What one small change? I think supports for Irish business, both in terms of 
financial supports at pivotal times. We spoke a little bit earlier on about that three to five years. But, you know, really we need to have something beyond that a little bit. Mentorship programmes would be really important. There's an awful lot of good information out there. And I think that people need, it's particularly small businesses where there might be just a few people trying to manage a business. They need a little bit of support from mentorship. So I think investing in training, education, mentoring would really, really help as well as a financial support. So I think that would help, you know. I think that would help a lot because there's a huge learning path that companies have to go through. Do you have a mentor? I don't have a specific mentor, but I listen uh, all the time to podcasts like your own, of course. And I read, uh, (laughs) I just take information from anywhere, anywhere at all. And I listen to everybody, you know, I think it's really, really important from people who just come in the door. And it's one of the things we say in VisionNet, we have people starting. Your opinion is really important. I know it's a line, it's easy to say, but it's really important. And I get some of our best guidance from people who just are coming in fresh, as well as people who've been here a while. So even even that voice of dissent in the boardroom or on the office floor, I welcome that. And the guys are going, yeah, yeah. But do you know what? There's a lot can be learned. You know, that's something I've learned over the last few years. You know, listen to everybody and, and think about it. Perfect opportunity to ask you. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? (laughs) So my hire in a heartbeat, this question, yikes. Um, So I think I would hire Trini Woodhull. Do you know who she is? I do indeed. And she has reinvented herself, hasn't she? That's what I love about her. That's what I love about her. she's doing, what is she, I mean, she was the, you know, Dress Yourself Better and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she was the Dress Yourself Better and she had this program which was syndicated in, you know, hundreds of countries worldwide. Trini set up a business, direct to consumer, and she took a left turn in the makeup industry when she was 53 years of age. So she wasn't on our screens or anything like that for, for a number of years. And she set up, she had 56,000 followers on Instagram, she 1.2 million now. Forbes valued her business at $250 million last year. She set it up five years ago, six years ago. Um, she's 50 million sales in the UK and she's selling in 193 countries. It's a direct to consumer brand for people who are 35 plus makeup brand, cosmetic brand, which has gone into skincare. And why I admire her, I think, is that she was tenacious. She was persistent. She just kept going. She had this idea and she was bubbling this idea for years. And then she went out to try and get investment. And she went and spoke to 10, 15 different investment people. And none of them were listening to her. None of them saw her vision and her creativity. And then she thought, well, hang on, what am I doing wrong? And she discovered that, look, I know what this is about, but I've got to join the dots. So what she said is she changed the pitch and she went, "Okay, I'm going to do A and that's going to get us to B. And when I do B, it's going to give you this. And then I'm going to go from here and maybe we'll go from here to here. And that's when everything changed. She sold her house as well. I mean, she, this is a woman who took investment, but also put everything on the line to great success. And she also brings up this elevator pitch where she brings up other entrepreneurs and gives them some time on her various different channels. So I love that about her. Doesn't take any other deal, commercial deals. The only brand that she promotes are her own or other people in uh, entrepreneurs. So I, I really admire her for all of the above. And as you say, she was up, down. down. And exactly. She's back up again. Exactly. I think she's written a book or something. She has, has written a book. I might go get it after this, and she could be another one of my mentors. Yeah, <laughs> she's got to do Bray, Remember, because they are big supporters. Love it. Yeah, they're here. That's right. They absolutely. Yeah, I will indeed. Let's see whether we can get her on to that great business. Show. I'd love to have her. I've absolutely. watched her on TV for decades. This I would it. say. Yeah. This is it. That is Christine Cullen, who is MD co-founder of Criff Vision Net. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. On Thank you. That great business show. That's great. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. Are you buying or selling a home? If it's for sale, it's on daft.ie. Ireland's number one property website. Travel to Connecticut, USA with Aer Lingus service to Bradley International Airport. With the daily flights from Dublin to Hartford, we make business travel to Connecticut easy. Save time with US pre-clearance, enjoy Aer Lingus award-winning flight service and experience the convenience of Bradley International Airport, perfectly situated for your travel needs. Learn more and plan your next business trip at aerlingus.com.
All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. Now, how is this for posh? We have the chair of the Small Firms Association, the SFA, in the house. The same woman is also Technology Ireland Person of the Year. And Geraldine McNair also happens to be co-founder of a company called Idero Analytics with her husband, Aidan Connolly. She's also an actor, a milliner. And I've also just spotted that she used to star on her own podcast. Mm. Busy lady. Better still, she's agreed to join us on That Great Business Show today. Geraldine McNair, welcome to That Great Business Show. Wow, what a lovely intro. Thank you. Hello. Well, we're delighted to have you here. Chair of the Small Firms Association, the SFA. Let's just start on that one. You're actually here to talk about it, or we'll get on to that in a second. What is worrying you? What is troubling you? What is making you really angry within the SFA these days? Okay, so for me, I'm not part of the SFA executive. So as a chair, um, we have a council who are all feedback from the ground up uh, on what's happening out there. One of the things that does anger me, I suppose, is when I hear economists generally speaking about how well the economy is doing without breaking it down. There's a huge concentration on how great multinationals do for this country, which they do. And we speak a lot about corporation tax receipts. Whereas I'd love to get the narrative a bit more balanced. Actually, 98% of businesses in Ireland are small. That's a hell of a lot of businesses. 1% is medium and 1% is large. It is nuts, isn't it? It is. Um, (laughs) And small businesses punch above their weight in so many ways. Uh, Income tax collection, just even their, what I would say, and I'd like the government to recognise this, small businesses are a social partnership because of the vitality and greater community well-being that they bring to every corner of Ireland in towns and villages, which is underspoken. So I suppose then you asked the question about what is it that I'm worried about at the moment. We've had um, a series of, like every nation in the world, of economic setbacks. However, when they happen to an island country or small businesses, the reverberation is greater and deeper. So we are now, for the first time ever, looking at the cost of doing business crisis and margins are lower. There's a huge amount of regulation because of technology and all of that's progression as well. That all comes at a huge cost to business owners who are time poor already as it is and their administration burden has gone through the roof as well as the costs of employment and running a business because of items like cybersecurity is on the rise and that's a big burden to small businesses. I'm going to add to your list of jobs from actor, milliner, business owner, SFA chair, tech person of the year. You're now Minister for Finance or Minister for Business. What one thing do you want to happen and to happen immediately? Two things come to mind. So can I have two? You may have as many as you wish. (laughs) Um, Go back to what I was saying there about small businesses playing out a great part um, across communities around Ireland. ESG, right, is coming down the track for all businesses and it's a hard one for small businesses to remain competitive when it when it starts to become mandatory around sustainability items. And I think we look at E as an environmental, S, social and G, governance. And governance, if you just put that over as regulation and um, some of the big changes that are needed won't be able to be carried out by small businesses. They're trying, but the cost of becoming sustainable in the environmental strand is very expensive. Um, The one item that seems to be very hard for a lot of companies to measure or governments or any framework out there is the S. And the S for me is the social cohesion. I would love to see the government immediately give small businesses some sort of derogation or tax credit, whatever guys would come in, just because they exist. Um, When we look across the towns of Ireland, we drive through towns, we see pretty flowers on the streets or we see nice lamps going on or cleanness or even the local community um, games with their kit. That often just comes from the small business in the town who are the rate payers. And if those rates aren't paid, then the towns and villages aren't so aesthetically pretty. It doesn't come from central um, government. So I think a lot of that and I think I would really push an education around um, localism. It's my new favourite word. Discuss. Localism means when we look at sustainability, we saw over COVID how we had breaks in supply chain. But now we're starting to realise the cost of large expanded supply chain. 
So localism, I spoke at the um, National Economic Dialogue this year and one of the strands on the title was deglobalization. And that really just means shortening the supply chain from provider to consumer. And I think we can do that in small towns. I would love the people of Ireland to realise and for the government to push behind this education that multiplier effect means if we shop locally rather than online outside of the country, every 20 euro will multiply to 100 euro. Whereas if we spend abroad, it goes and it never comes back again. So localism means actually multiplying and making the economy more um, healthy financially and socially. So I'd love a program of um, education on localism and the multiplier effect. The localism one, how would you drive it? Is it a big public information campaign? Or? I'll give you a small example, right? I was travelling on the train last week and I love eavesdropping and I was <laughs> listening to these ladies talk about a fairly global brand that's from the other side of the world. And I suppose, I don't without mentioning their exact name. You can. <laughs> Sheen then. Um, One of the ladies said to her friend, oh, you wouldn't believe what I got on Sheen. It was only 40 euro and it was a great price. And they went on and on about it. And I just felt like saying that 40 euro could have created 200 euro in your own economy. People think 40 euro is cheap. Whereas in actual fact, if we have to look after the labour force because of employment issues, We'll pay through our taxes for for Dole or the, the local, you know, independent will close down. So that 40 euro is very expensive. I know what you mean. Yep. So yeah, yeah. It's just, a circular. Yep. It's yep. a circular, yeah. Um, so just for people to be aware of that, even if they ran advertisements on TV. Now, I know that it's not, and I just want to reiterate this point, that localism is not about shopping for Irish produce. We are in the EU and we have great trades with loads of different countries. So it's about buying something that is just down the road from you. Okay in that person's shop, wherever it came from, from their supply chain. And while you're still remembering the second point, I'm <laughs> going to ask you about why you are here, because we, you are here to tell us all about Idero Analytics. What do you do? What is the company? Um, so Idero Analytics is a leading AI and data analytics company specialising. Stop reading that. I know. <laughs> what do you, I was afraid of missing any point. Don't tell me that you don't know what you do. No, I do. It's just we do a lot. So I'm making sure to cover it off. So we're actually Ireland's longest established AI company. Well, I had to ask, when I saw AI and then I said, now wait, you couldn't have been doing AI 20 years ago, were you? Yeah, we were. Not in the way that it's being done now. Like the machines were not not crawling everything back then. You might have been crawling, as in checking out uh, information, but there wasn't machine crawling or computer crawling. Well, first of all, AI is way older than 20 years, okay? But one of the reasons why we think it's very new is because originally it would have been a preserve of those with large budgets. Massive budgets. So now it's become more accessible and there's a lot more tools available to the consumer market. So therefore we're hearing a lot more noise about it. Whereas our business and a lot of other AI businesses would have been B2B. So on that, you know, one of the items that's going across all media at the moment is generative AI, which is based on machine learning. And we were doing machine learning 20 years ago. So I suppose it's the applications of AI is where we might look at it differently. And now the big reveal. What do you do? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so we do AI strategy for companies. Um, We also do AI bias auditing. Uh, We look into algorithms, seek out where there's some bias or any other anomalies. We then do... What's a bias? Say AI bias auditing. Yeah. Biases towards or against what? What are you actually looking for? Okay, this has got a broad application, but I'll just give you an example of it, right? So in this world that we live in now, where we look at talent recruitment or whatnot, we, we have a thing that a lot of companies use um, their automated decision-making tools. and To recruit. To recruit or to promote within an organisation. So some of them might even be, you know, psychometric tests, um, also scanning of CV documents and all that. So I suppose when companies come to us and say, can you look through this tool for us, make sure that it doesn't have bias. AI can have bias. Because if the person behind it who made it has bias, well, then 
this term the past in the past. Well, unfortunately, it's not. If the AI in the past was built on a bias, it learns from that bias and perpetuates and compounds the problem. So we would look through people's algorithms, businesses' algorithms, to see if there are biases in there and detect that, call it out and recode and patch, fix it. What kinds of companies might use you? Well, the great thing about what we do is we are usable across all verticals and industries. We're agnostic. But typically companies in insurances, telcos, uh, universities, banks, and even cleaning companies. So, Well, OK, talk to me about a cleaning company. A cleaning company rings you up and says what? What are they looking for? An audit about their biases? No, that would be, no, that was a, that was an example of an application to seek yeah. out. Well, let's look at it this way then. I'm going to give you a, a use case on it. If they were recruiting, if they wanted to turn around and say, look, we're definitely really interested in making sure that our our staff are diverse and inclusive. So we might look into how they're recruiting and therefore it will throw out maybe a different thing. But that wouldn't be it. A typical use. Um, it might be just that they have efficiencies in their use of robotics and it could be sensors. So also, I suppose one of the main reasons why we're used is companies tend to, if they're adopting or implementing AI, they need to fit it into the greater scope of their business and use other learnings from it to optimize all of the learnings from AI. And are you paid per hour? or for per case or per project or what's the business model? Well, we all are in the early stages of AI adoption implementation. So it's very much case by case. It's not a monthly subscriber item. But yeah, so it would be very much on the particular bespoke project. And everybody at the moment is at different stages of their own digital transformation and their own journey. So no, I couldn't give you a quote now for any work here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll get back to me on it. I of will course. for sure, yeah. And I'll give you a mate rate. I love that. I keep using that of late and I just think it's one of the great terms of our time, mates rates. Yeah. So first of all, are you just Ireland or international or and how are you finding business? Where do you go trolling? Okay, so we are international. We have actually had a presence in over 40 countries and analysed 20% of the world's population. But as an Irish company, we deal in multinationals here in Ireland and also independence. You could find us anywhere. And how are you finding new customers? Where are you trawling, as I say? Well, because we're so well established, we are fortunate that a lot of inquiries come our way. I love the idea that you're so well established because I know an awful lot about business in Ireland, I think, and you are a little gem, as I have never come across you before. Well, you know, this is really interesting as well in another way, and I think I might be able to explain it. When I go back to 20 years ago, it was really hard to do business in Ireland. We, oh, we were yeah. determined to stay in Ireland, yeah. but our business came from North America, um, Asia, elsewhere, even though we were so dedicated to being in Ireland. One of the things I definitely would have said is that there was a pain to being a pioneer. People did not get what we were doing going back. So we spent maybe the best part of a decade educating the market. Yeah, that is a bit of a pain actually, isn't it? taking the brunt of that, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, yeah. That happens in all businesses. There is a company down in Limerick border that made craft beer and they had to educate the market. And then the market moved in on top of them. And it wasn't fair, but that's business. It is. Yeah, it's tough. I think that it's a, it's a real learning, though. I would very much say that no matter where you are in the world, even if you're a high tech company and you can work allegedly anywhere, it's still really important to find an ecosystem where people can understand what you're doing. Are there many of you in Idaro Analytics? There are 25 at the moment. We're down on our staff count since last year. I think it's just so typical of all tech companies at the moment. We're down by 20% or more. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And now part of that is there's been a natural attrition and also the housing crisis has not helped us. While we are a tech company, we do like to have a model of hybrid working. So for innovation alone, or just even for culture, it's really important to us to have people come to the office as well. So if we were to fill the vacancies just via remote, it would have been okay. We would have filled them. So we're holding out somewhat to mind our culture 
and, you know, keep energy in the room. And where is the tech world at the moment in terms of that downturn? Has it turned the corner yet? Are you back hiring again? Are people back hiring again? We're constantly looking. Um, For? I suppose right now, less so the R&D place, more kind of management um, leadership skills around AI and what we do. So that can be a hard one because you need a good commercial head as well as somebody that has got technical know-how. And are you getting that technical know-how taught uh, in Ireland or is it coming in from abroad or are we doing enough? It strikes me frequently, like we do an awful lot of good things in third level, Mm. but frequently we also are left behind and Eastern Europe certainly is way ahead in some areas like that. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I think that would be correct. So for us to try and mitigate that somewhat, we have taken on graduates where we run a postgraduate program, like an apprenticeship for nine months, just to try and bring people on because it isn't easy getting who you want. That's cool. Tell me more about that because uh, there may be somebody listening who's little Johnny or Jill or is listening and uh, they might like them to do that. What kind of training do you give them and where do you do that? We do it on on premises. And so, again, that's another reason why it's really important to us as a company to have people in the office as well in a hybrid manner, because learning and onboarding just in isolation at home isn't isn't so fruitful. So we bring in people that have actually very mixed backgrounds. Some of them have maybe been in other careers and have gone to technology later in their life and So we employ that type of diversity as well. We put people on contracts and they're mentored the whole way through and also given a lot of autonomy. So that goes on for nine months and we have a huge success rate on that one. We probably convert maybe 85 to 90 percent of those in apprenticeship into full time employment. That is excellent. Yeah. Funding. Final final question on this section because I'm going to ask you about your heart and heartbeat in two seconds. Funding. How are you funded? Are you funded well or do you need funding or anything like that? But you'd never say no to money, would you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Great answer and an honest answer. <laughs> um, look, I think the best funding is true revenue, right? Mm-hmm. So sales are where it's at. We are actually a client of Enterprise Ireland, so we would get um, guidance and support that way, but we don't have any VCs over our back. But you might like one. Yeah, I mean... If one came in with a big truckload of money, they're not I'm doing a lot of persuasion. <laughs> big fact check. Hire in a heartbeat. Who would a Geraldine Magnier hire in a heartbeat? I would hire Lorna Martin. Now, She's... Here's a name that I don't recognise. Okay, that does surprise me. I'll tell you why. So Lorna Martin's from Fidelity Investments mm-hmm. in the Irish branch and she is a vice president of technology. I think she's got about 1,900 people that okay. she minds. small operation. It's a small operation, <laughs> yeah. Um, Lorna, anyway, uh, this is why I'm surprised. She's many accolades, right? And she won an award recently for, it was from the American Chamber and for her work that she does both sides of the Atlantic. Okay. But, um, she hasn't been on the, the, that great business show yet. Let me put it that way. Otherwise yeah. I would know her. Maybe she should come on. Oh, well, if you did manage to get her, uh, it would be an amazing coup Have for you. you met with her? Well, yeah, so this is where I'm going to go with this. So when you read her, her profile, you could see why one would hire her. But I actually have the privilege of working along with her on Technology Ireland, the board. She was the former chair of that. But I suppose here's the thing, and this is why she stands out for me. When we're setting off in our careers as people, if you go the corporate route, you know, you're mentored into getting somebody to champion you and sponsor you within the organisation. However, if you're an entrepreneur, all of that type of champion um, work and sponsoring comes external to your organisation. And I've observed her over the years to just look out for so many people that are in business themselves and she's really just going behind them. And she's also famous for her diversity and inclusion work. Laura Martin, we love you. <laughs> and more importantly, whereas Geraldine wants to hire you, we want to interview you. I'd love to have the chat. Yeah, no, she's an amazing personality. Cool. Well, if she gives me a call or gets onto the website. We'll even send her if she signs up for the uh, podcast. You know, she does it? listen to you. Really? You actually came up in conversation there oh, one day and she does listen away. to you. There you go. I understand. You should have told me that earlier. Then I would have said, Lorna Martin, my best friend, because then I would have known. <laughs> but anyway, we'll get her. But she might. She could actually get flights to the US by just signing up for the podcast. How about that? Wow. That's a, a little competition we're running at the moment. Geraldine, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. That is Geraldine Magnier of Idero Analytics also chair of that 
small firm association, not that small firm association, the SFA known to one and all. If it's for sale, it's on daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. Whether you're looking for your first home or planning your next move, make sure you're on daft.ie, the best place to buy or sell in Ireland. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. It's all go like Chrissy Gno on thatgreatbusinessshow.com. That great business show. And that is it from That Great Business Show, episode 159. Great business insights and inspiration. All thanks to our sponsor, daft.ie, Ireland's number one property website. If you are looking for your first home, or maybe you're looking to upsize or downsize, make sure to visit daft.ie to find the next place you call home and sign up for the email updates. I was just saying it there. And we will send you your own personal copy of the podcast. The address is thatgreatbusinessshow.com. And that is where to go if you would like to advertise with us as well. We record here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios, which is always credit checked for great sound. Heads of sound for the Sound Vaults today is studio engineer David Tai. Later, the enforcer, studio manager Peter Rice, will run some of his own background checks, ensuring we remain the world's best-sounding business podcast. Peter Rice is also the man to talk to if you would like to record your own podcast here in Dundrum, Dublin. So from me, Conal O'Moran, we host to you all a Beslan Tamil.